So it's great to have everybody here for an exciting uh, CTIP CAN call for the month of September, where we'll be focusing on early childhood trauma-informed interventions, practices, and services. Um, my name is Jesse Kohler. I'm the executive director for the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, uh, joined by Dan Press, our uh, advisor, counsel, and uh, mentor, and Marlo Nash, co-chair of the National Trauma Campaign, who will actually be leading the majority of the CTIP CAN call today. Um, Marlo, if, or Dan, uh, if you don't mind letting people in to the waiting room while I go through uh, RISE and ARPA. Uh, to start the call, Dan and I are just going to go over and review the RISE from Trauma Act and the American Rescue Plan Act. For many of you, this is probably a review. Uh, for some, it may be new information, and there is still really great time and opportunity to uh, advocate for advancement of trauma-informed resilience-focused and healing-centered uh, practices through these two pieces of legislation. So the to start, the Rise from Trauma Act is has been introduced in the Senate. Uh, we have been promoting uh, bipartisan co-sponsorship for the bill, um, and that is still necessary. Um, for those who don't know, the Rise from Trauma Act has uh, several components that would advance the trauma-informed field. It was introduced on the Senate side by Senators uh, Urban and from West Virginia. And um, it, it, we are expecting it to be introduced into the House on the, on the House side soon as well. Uh, <laughs> Section 101 would create a grant program of $4.8 billion over the course of eight years. Uh, for local trauma coordinating bodies, which would really help to fund community coalitions. And we're really excited for that. Your advocacy as community members that are doing trauma informed work in the field is integral to supporting um, that. And then there are also different components that would support workforce development and developing a trauma informed workforce, as well as several other components. Um, after I'm done speaking here, I will put into the chat easy links for people to take action on that, to send emails and or tweets to your senators. All that you have to do is fill in the link um, with your address. It'll pull up the senator um, or your two senators and provide an easy way for you to take action there. Uh, if you want to take a next step, we also have uh, form language that we can send to you and send you uh, staffers in your senator's offices to reach out to to encourage them again in a more personal way to support the rise from trauma act and so we currently or we we definitely encourage folks to uh, to support there and take action on the rise from trauma act um, and we will continue to promote that and drive that forward we'll be in touch as you know the house of representatives introduces the bill as well and keep people updated on progress. The other piece uh, that I wanted to talk about is the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, which is the stimulus bill uh, that came out around the uh, at the beginning of the Biden administration to support recovery from uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And there is a link in the chat to uh, a toolkit to support people with the American Rescue Plan Act. There's a summary that goes over the various places where American Rescue Plan Act funds can be leveraged for trauma-informed supports. Um, we have talking points documents to support your advocacy around those funds, um, an education-specific two-pager, as well as webinar PowerPoint slides and a webinar that we did a few months ago that goes more deep into the information than I will be able to do today because we want to leave time, obviously, for the main topic of the CTIP CAN call and for our wonderful presenters that we have today. But just to emphasize that um, there is still time and opportunity to leverage the funding that's available uh, for education and early childhood education. I know that that is perfect for what we're discussing today. There's also money that's going to states, municipalities, and uh, tribal communities that can support, again, trauma-informed coalitions and developing um, trauma-informed, resilience-focused, healing-centered, and grassroots-led supports leveraging those federal dollars. 
some health, some money in the behavioral health and healthcare sectors, and some other locations as well. And so we strongly encourage folks to go to that link, traumacampaign.org slash ARPA, and look, don't hesitate to reach out to us. I will pass it over to Dan to do an appropriations report um, in a second, and I'll put my email in the chat. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Also, my normal spiel, if you haven't yet joined the National Trauma Campaign as an advocate, I will put that link in the chat as well. We encourage people to join and get other folks to join as well. And if you are not on the CTIP CAN listserv, but want follow up from the CTIP CAN call and want to be want to get notice for future calls as well, please don't hesitate to reach out to me for that reason also. And I will give uh, I am happy to put you on the listserv. And um, so I will put my email and the links that I just discussed in the chat now. Uh, but Dan, I will pass it over to you to discuss um, the appropriations report. Sure, thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy September. Um, the, uh, if you're asking yourself, why should I spend my time lobbying Congress? Uh, I return to a quote by a very famous American, Willie Sutton, who when asked, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. And why do you lobby Congress? Because that's where the money is. And the benefit of doing that is, um, is now on exhibit. Uh, four or five years ago, there was not a penny appropriated by the Appropriations Committee for Trauma-Informed Programs, because it wasn't on their radar screen. And thanks to the work of everybody on this call and lots of people all over the country, that has now changed. And in the FY22 House Appropriations Bill for Labor Education, Labor, Health and Human Services Education, there are over 30 line items providing uh, money for trauma-informed programs, uh, including uh, 7 million for CDC to expand its programs to assist state governments implement trauma-informed programs, a million dollars for the uh, Interagency Council on Trauma-Informed Programs, and <coughs> excuse me, a number of other items. So the work you're doing, educating your Congress people, educating their staff about trauma is paying off in hard, cold cash. Um, and one of the most effective lobbying groups is the group that's pushing for the subject of today's presentation, early childhood mental health. You read through uh, the appropriations report that came out of the house and over and over again, the committee says we are concerned about early childhood mental health and that investing money in early childhood mental health will save us money down the road because it's much cheaper to help people, the kids when they're, they're little than waiting till they grow up and then the mental health problems explode all over the scene. So are you going to put up the uh, slide? Yeah, I will uh, share it in the chat again. I pasted it earlier for those who opened oh. it, but there's the link again that Dan's referring to. Yeah, <laughs> if you read through a uh, number 14 in particular, the committee expresses its emphasis on early childhood mental health. And we, of course, we know ACEs and traumas and key part of that. So, uh, Little by little, the Congress is moving towards the same priorities as the people on this call. And the timing is perfect for our presentation today, which is about innovative programs for uh, addressing early childhood mental health. And for that, our moderator is going to be Marlo Nash. So Marlo, take it from here. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> So this uh, CTIP CAN topic was actually scheduled months ago, uh, but could not be more timely. And I think I want to pick up on Dan's good news um, to say that with everything that's gone on, there's momentum growing uh, in support of early relational health, um, in part reaching that through trauma-informed approaches, program settings, services, and systems. Um, that the pressing need to find ways to uh, strengthen mental well-being in light of the pandemic and of other 
traumatic events is causing more conversation and attention around supporting better mental health and better outcomes for young children. However, I want to go back to Jesse's report about the American Rescue Plan and um, issue a call to action to everyone on the call um, <clears throat> and make something very clear because this is really important for the moment we're in. Hopefully, Congress will appropriate the dollars that Dan talked about. That's in the future. What's What we have right now is a whole lot of money available to states through the American Rescue Plan Act, but very few resources, very few provisions of the American Rescue Plan Act were designed specifically for infants and toddlers. Um, there's a great body of work that was done by a number of national early childhood organizations, and I'm going to chat to you the link um, right now, that says here are many ways different provisions from the American Rescue Plan dollars could be spent on infants and toddlers, but very few of them are supposed to be spent on infants and toddlers. And what that means is people like you are incredibly important to be advocating in your states, lifting up the needs of infants and toddlers, making specific recommendations about how flexible rescue plan dollars could be spent to address the mental health needs of infants and toddlers. Um, so just by comparison, um, through the three major COVID uh, response and relief, act that, uh, that, uh, relief acts that Congress passed, the K through 12 system specifically received $189.5 billion. Now, some of the, the, it is allowable to spend some of that money on young children, but it's not designed for young children. So $189.5 billion to K through 12, almost nothing to infants and toddlers. It's such a horrifying gap. And this is why you are so needed to step into that gap and make some links um, in your state. You can ha feel free to chat questions because we can we can answer questions about uh, what does that look like, what does it mean. But one of the things that um, we're we're happy to share today is something that CTIP has been working on, just to give you one concrete example of um, of something that could be done. And I just want to before I share that with you, I just want to share a few. Um, facts and maybe you're tracking the data and you know all this already, but just because of, of how what you all care about and all that you know and all that you're trying to do, I just want to lift up some things that really um, underscore the sense of urgency. So in uh, the uh, census is doing pulse data right now to try to get current uh, a current snapshot of how COVID the, the pandemic is impacting households. So in June of this year, 28% of adults in households with children reported feeling stress or anxiety. 19% of adults in households with children felt down, down, depressed, or hopeless. Hopeless, And that was in June before the recent surge. So when we think about the infants and toddlers that are in those households, we, you all are people who know how that anxiety, depression, and hopelessness is impacting early childhood mental health and development. In July, 37% of American families with children were on the verge of eviction or foreclosure, and that was before the eviction uh, morat moratorium was lifted, so that it's very likely that's even worse now. So again, infants and toddlers that are in those really stressful home situations, potentially now homeless, are impacted. And in the child care realm, the child care workforce and industry has been hit hard. Um, we know that uh, parents are finding it harder to find childcare for their children, which causes stress. And some recent research tells us that stress around lack of childcare is actually one of the leading causes of child maltreatment. So it's another um, disturbing fact about what's going on right now. And more generally about COVID, in many states, they're starting to calculate that one in 500 people in their state have died from COVID, not contracted, but have died. one in 500 have died from COVID. And there's a study uh, in, uh, in the August um, uh, edition of the JAMA Pediatrics uh, Journal that, that indicates the childcare work 
workforce is disproportionately impacted by COVID deaths and hospitalizations because of the communities they live in and the susceptibility of the people in those communities. So you all know that incomplete grieving processes can result in poor mental health, um, post-traumatic stress, and post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. All of that affects the relational capacities of caregivers. <clears throat> So as a result, we're very concerned that children are not having their relational and developmental needs met and that both staff and children in childcare are at risk of developing PTS and PTSD if we don't do something to intervene. So CTIP has been working on what we've been referring to as a plug and play framework to try to help um, child care administrators who have access to the Child Care Stabilization Fund, which was part of the American Rescue Plan Act, to try to help them have um, the framework for how do, they, how, to have, how do they have a continuum of supports that ensure that child care settings and programs and systems become trauma-informed and as part of having a, an overall holistic approach of infant um, and early childhood mental health consultation. Um, so, uh, we are, um, we're not going to spend time today really going over the framework. I do, if you'll bear with me one moment, I do want to just pop it onto the screen just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, if this share function works, it doesn't look like it's going to work. There we go. Um, it's if for the, again, for those of you who do a lot of trauma informed uh, systems work, training, all of that, this um, may seem like logical to you. But we got advice several months ago when, when we discovered that the Child Care Stabilization Fund can be spent on addressing the mental health needs of, of child care providers and children in care. Um, that uh, the information, the, the advice that we got <clears throat> from the Biden Harris administration is that uh, state offices of child care might need some way to easily understand how, what, what should they fund, what could they fund, what are the possibilities of um, what would help support their, their systems in becoming fully trauma informed and healing centered. Um, so this framework, um, you can see, walks through different levels of competency um, and has different recommendations for from training to coaching to communities of practice to assessment. Um, so I'm not going into it in detail now, but just to let you know that we're developing it, it will, we are not promoting a particular approach. So we will have a menu of program options that will go along with it, along with some cost modeling of how much it costs. And the, the, the big takeaway today, stop sharing my screen, is that on September 30th, we will be um, offering a webinar to go into greater detail about the framework um, and to answer questions and uh, really help explain the need and all of that, all the detail. I am delighted that our guests today, Drs. Mulcahy and Costa, are gonna be on that um, webinar. So I wanna call that to your attention because you, what you hear them present today will be repeated um, as part of that webinar. So you will have heard it, but this is my, my appeal to you, is use this webinar as an opportunity to gather stakeholders and partners in your state and ask them to also register for the, reg the webinar alongside you and we'll take will make your pathway easy of uh, explaining the need and sort of setting up the whole um, opportunity and the appeal that they think about spending child care stabilization funds on making sure out of this that their system is trauma informed. Um, and as you listen to um, Caitlin and Jerry, Dr. Mulcahy and Dr. Costa in just a moment, um, listen with that, that understanding that what they're describing to you, what they've done, what they did in New Jersey after um, Superstorm Sandy was to help everyone understand how as a population level traumatic event, Superstorm Sandy required a systems level response to address early relational health and respond to the trauma that everyone had experienced. We've now as a nation, of course, had a population level trauma 
So now we're trying to take what New Jersey has done, which is as a case example, and make sure it's happening all over the country. So um, I'm delighted that they're here today to share that with you. Delighted that we're partnering to be able to offer this case example. I believe New Jersey is on the leading edge of this. And so um, I'm really thrilled that you're going to get to hear from them. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge that CTIP board member and, and my colleague Suzanne O'Connor um, has been working on this framework with me and um, Diane Wagenhalls and um, Marshall Morgan and others have been involved. Um, and I'm going to ask Suzanne if you're on uh, to chat the registration link to the webinar and um, encourage you guys to register now and please get get people to have a watch party, get people to join from your state, um, join us on the 30th. And now um, I'm gonna take a minute to introduce uh, Caitlin and Jerry. So um, I, I've already said a little bit about their work. Caitlin is the Associate Director and Jerry's the Director of the Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health at Montclair State University in New Jersey. They work to together to develop and deliver programs and technical assistance that promote infant and early childhood mental health. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, notably, they help their state leaders understand the need for systems level response to population level traumas. And now, um, as Caitlin and I checked in on Monday, she said, you know, now they're responding to Ida. So this capacity that they've built is deployed again for another population level trauma in their state. Um, they partnered at that time to develop a systems level response, which included developing and distributing the trauma-informed curriculum they call Keeping Babies and Children in Mind, which you will learn um, more about that. Um, and I think I've said everything else that uh, I have in front of me by way of introduction. So please add, uh, Caitlin and Jerry, anything to your introduction that you'd like to. And we are so delighted you're here. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Marlo, and thank you everyone for having us. Um, I think that's I think that's good. We're we're well uh, well introduced, I think. So, um, just gonna quickly share my screen. Um, Jerry, anything else you want to sh to share as I do, as nope. I do that? No, thanks so much. Uh, we're thrilled to be here again, Marlo. Okay, great. Um, so, as Marlo said, we're going to talk a little bit about this story of um, a population level disaster trauma response. Um, but to begin, we wanted to make sure it's clear that this was done um, because of a group of people's creativity, courage, voice, and access, um, and that these folks had relationships with one another over time. So the story that we're telling today didn't just happen out of nowhere. It really was due to former relationships um, that really informed a group of people's understanding that trauma response starts with a promotional mindset. So um, this is slightly different than what might happen in what Jerry always calls a firefighter model where, you know, something bad happens, call the firefighter. You know, this, this really became possible because there was uh, really deep roots of relationship um, that had happened years before um, and that the learning that happened through those relationships about the importance of intervening in young families' lives as early as possible, that, um, that our work in infant early childhood family work is what ends up being um, strong trauma response, um, strong intervention down the line because of actually a promotional mindset. That's really how this got started. And so because of that, um, we had champions at the table at the state level after Superstorm Sandy hit our state, who had already in their minds the understanding that if we were to be able to support the trauma response of infants and young children, we had to focus on the workforce who cared for them. So this promotional mindset really called us towards the infant early childhood family workforce. And so for us, this IECF workforce is multidisciplinary, working in multiple systems. Um, think about anything that you can imagine that works with young children. So early intervention, childcare, um, home evidence-based home visiting, doula work, pediatrics, um, preschool teachers, uh, clinicians, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but think really broadly about all those who intersect with young children, including people like who work at child care resource and referral agencies who help families who receive subsidy for child care or people who work at um, WIC offices. 
this is the workforce we're talking about when we think about the IECF workforce. And because we know that the importance of relationships is at the core of all of these disciplines, and also the common ground on which all of those systems stand, um, we recognize that uh, trauma response um, after a population level disaster has to also really focus on how do we help those practitioners recognize themselves as part of an early relational health workforce. And, and we just wanna always say that our understanding of relationships is that culture and context potentiate relationships which then potentiate development. So we, we you'll see this again, it's, it's sort of everybody's business. It's all of us, all of our work um, is necessary as one of the, I was chatting with Leanne in the chat before when um, she had had the comment that healthy infants create healthy adults. And, and I sort of made a joke, yeah, and vice versa, healthy adults create healthy infants. It really is all of us. <laughs> um, when we think about the, the work of infant early childhood family work, it, it then becomes the adults with whom we're working in our workplaces. It's the adults who then care for other children. So this early relational health workforce is critical to focus on, particularly in times of trauma. And so when we think about that workforce, um, we want them to feel as prepared as possible to consider themselves able to work through relationships. Um, and so we want to have uh, the workforce focused on relationship-based reflective practice that's informed by infant and, and early childhood mental health theory. Um, and again, this is because in order to consider ourselves an early relational health workforce, we have to be able to centralize relationships at the center of all we do. Um, alongside that is the science of safety and stress, including toxic stress and trauma. Um, that's a part of that preparation. And we specifically name the science of safety and stress, sometimes even more than we say trauma-informed care or healing-centered, um, because we do find that there's a little bit more of a connection, oh, the science of safety, like tell me more about that. Um, and it may not even um, come against the barrier of what might happen when someone's talking about trauma-informed care and a practitioner who might be a child care provider or maybe that CCNR, RNR referral specialist might say, oh, that's not my job. I, I don't, you know, I'm not in mental health. I don't do trauma. Um, sometimes the science of safety and then the science of stress feels like, oh yeah, okay, I can, I can get behind that. I can know that. I can feel confident in, in the fact that what I know can be shared then with families and children. And so we, we believe that when the workforce is given this preparation, um, they're then considered promotional. You know, they're promotional in their ability to support families, which then prevent traumatic experiences. But also that promotion side also ensures that we are prepared after a trauma has occurred. Um, so you'll see, for example, Keeping Babies and Children in Mind was developed after Superstorm Sandy, but became really useful after um, and during and still <laughs> during COVID. Um, but yet we believe that some of our providers, some of our practitioners, some of our workforce were even better off um, uh, responding and allowing for more rapid and appropriate, uh, appropriate restoration and repair because we had been doing this work over time. So our example that we're going to share today that Jerry was going to speak about now is our curriculum known as Keeping Babies and Children in Mind. So thanks, Caitlin, and how nice for us to be here again with all of you. So um, following Superstorm Sandy, that, that major event that hit the East Coast a number of years ago, um, our center was able to pull together um, a large gathering of public and private partners, including the national uh, partners such as Zero to Three, Save the Children, a private organization, um, the um, Federal Administration for Children, Youth and Families, ACYF, for our region, as well as our local uh, community and state partners. Um, and really within eight days of, of Superstorm Sandy com coming to our coast, um, we gathered and tried to send the message that while all of our efforts must now be to restore 
safety and restore order and housing and food and connections and and all the the elements of life that uh, those who uh, respond to disasters must do but we had to really remember about the nature of relationships and what was happening to the caregivers of those infants and toddlers and preschoolers and so we gathered this large group of folks and then subsequently developed um, a fairly detailed training that we offered to anyone who was willing to come and make a commitment that they would accept this training. We would provide them with a turnkey way of talking about the nature of human attachment what happens to infants and young children and toddlers and their caregivers under stress and trauma. Um, and so they, we gave them a turnkey uh, set of information. Uh, and that uh, commitment they had to make was that they promised they would deliver it to community organizations and child care centers in their region, in their area, in their geography. They couldn't charge for it. They couldn't change anything about it. Um, and, uh, and it turned out to be just a remarkable response. Um, we actually prepared an article for uh, Zero to Three, the national uh, journal uh, published by Zero to Three, the national organization, and the reference is provided on a slide subsequently. Well, that initial response galvanized, I think, a large number of people to really shift their thinking, not just about uh, the recovery process, but that the relational disruptions that stress created and this trauma created um, in, in a, a way that uh, I think many people didn't appreciate. You know, one of, one of our favorite uh, sayings is that a fish doesn't know it's in water. And so many times, uh, folks, these wonderful, caring people in FEMA and uh, emergency response units are so incredibly attuned to help families in crisis, but might not know that there's a baby or a toddler or a preschooler in the place, in the room, in the space. And, uh, and I've done lots of work, by the way, with uh, police officers who have responded to violence. Um, I worked with the Child Development Community Policing Project in, um, at Yale for a number of years and Safe Start. Some of you may know the OJJDP uh, program for birth to six children who witnessed trauma. And it was remarkable to discover these wonderfully trained people weren't aware that babies were there. And it's partly because the fish, uh, the, the, the water they've been swimming in just hasn't always made that clear. So that led us to subsequently within a, a year of Superstorm Sandy or so, develop a seven session curriculum called Keeping Babies and Children in Mind. We call this, by the way, 21 hours of professional formation. And we use the term formation very deliberately. For us, it's not simply about teaching people about the science and the information and the research regarding trauma and brain development and attachment processes and systems and reflective practices and adult characteristics uh, such as attunement, co-regulation. I suspect many of you have heard these terms, right? But it's not just about the knowledge, but it's about trying to translate that knowledge into some meaningful interventions and practices. But more importantly, and most importantly, to translate that knowledge and practice into how it is experienced by other people with whom you work through the nature of your relationship with them. And so we talk about formation as ways of knowing, ways of doing, and ways of being with. And we have found in our work that the least attended to are the ways of being with. Your, your voice, your facial gestures, uh, your movement, your pacing, um, everything about you. We, we developed an acronym called AGILE, A-G-I-L-E. Pay attention to your affect, your gestures, your intonation, by far the most important, by the way. Latency, meaning give people and kids a chance to take you in. When you're under stress, your processing is so compromised. And then when they take you and engage them, 
A-G-I-L-E. And so keeping babies in mind began this process. And so in addition to the 21 hours of didactic, we provided uh, groups of reflective practice. We started at, the fir at first for the 10 counties, 10 of 21 counties in New Jersey, most affected by Superstorm Sandy, but quickly um, expanded it to the entire state. And we invited staff from all sectors, including uh, early care and education, uh, home visiting, uh, early Head Start and Head Start, early intervention, family care providers, preschools, elementary schools, child protective services, every imaginable sector. Um, and um, since the time we launched uh, Keeping Babies and Children in Mind, we've delivered it in whole or in part to over 9,000 participants. Our goal was to raise the floor of knowledge about infant and early childhood mental health and the nature of human relationships, the relational context of development, of brain development, of recovery and restoration through trauma. Um, and so the interpersonal process um, was by far the most critical and probably one of the most appreciated elements had been to really introduce people to the notion of reflection, of reflectivity, reflective practice, of, as my old supervisor used to say, getting in cahoots with yourself, understanding that we each have some element that gets stirred up in us by this work, and we have an obligation to pay attention to that. And so the goals really uh, were essentially these five core uh, themes that are on this slide. Our goal was to be sure people understood early experiences matter for all future learning and connectivity. People, early experiences, by the way, as many of you may know that zero to three's slogan for many years was early experience matters. Um, development occurs through relationships, the notion of interpersonal neurobiology, interpersonal regulation. These are things that I think have become for the KBCN participants really understood. Um, experience builds, uh, repairs, uh, uh, repairs um, difficulties and leads to resilience. Um, Michael Lewis, a very well-known um, developmental psychologist from New Jersey, author of over 20 books about infants and young children, talks about experience and relationships as moving around a lot of basic biology. Our relationships change brain systems. Our relationships matter. Uh, one of our colleagues talks the, about the early care and education folks as brain engineers to let them know how critical their roles are. As Caitlin said, culture and context. This is not a one size fits all. This is not uh, a response that is off the rack. You must really embed yourself in a, in a posture of cultural humility, of really being taught by those with whom you are helping and working uh, with uh, about uh, their own uh, understanding of the nature of trauma what their response is, um, you know, uh, the, the cultural piece is so critical. And I remember um, having done um, some work with the Sitka tribe of Alaska, Native Alaskan tribe, where I was there to offer them some insights about how Western psychology has really managed to work on trauma. And I remember leaving there after five days, learning much more about how tribal ways of healing was so much more meaningful. And I found myself understanding more. So, and obviously this is all about uh, getting in cahoots with yourself, being aware that you're in a fishbowl. What are your own limitations? What are your own uh, barriers, um, your own limited perspectives? And so reflectivity, uh, connecting who you are with what you are doing in the work. So uh, this was about with KBM. So let me turn it over back to Caitlin and uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep going. Thank you, Jerry. So as you, as you heard, right after Sandy, we were able to provide essentially what was a three-hour workshop curriculum out to as many people as wanted it so that they could raise the awareness that infants and young children were affected by the storm as well. Um, from there, that married with, again, these relationships that happened over time and a champion at the state level who said, we're going to use block grant funds to expand on that 
three hour workshop, which just to say we we did send out with no cost. We wanted to be um, as equitable as possible to the access of information. Um, then this champion said, I think we can expand on that. And so that workshop became what in our Keeping Babies and Children in, uh, in Mind series uh, is workshop four. So sort of the, the zenith of this little story we tell up to workshop four and then come back down again through workshop seven. So trauma became really the, the focus of how that, that entire curriculum was created, but we were able to expand because of this champion's understanding that in some ways, just teaching about trauma without teaching about the science of safety and stress, without teaching about how relationships matter, about how important you as the, as the caregiver are to the development of young children, it wouldn't have been enough. And she knew that. And so what was so great is after two years of funding from Superstorm Sandy Block Grant Funds, um, our Department of Human Services picked this funding up and we were able to spread the eligibility to all 21 counties of the state. And that was funded through Child Care Development Block Grant Funds. So even though that was child care money, we were still allowed to, to keep the multidisciplinary focus. Um, and that was, again, a, a sense that DHS had had at that time about the critical ability um, uh, to create a network and a web of support for families if those professionals also got to know what each other did and got to even know each other. Um, doulas were meeting child care providers, were meeting child welfare workers, right? So it was becoming uh, more of a connected system, even just through the relationships forming at the KBCM trainings. So as Jerry said, it's a little higher, 10,000, over 10,000 infant and early childhood professionals have um, attended at least one workshop, and many of whom uh, of that number have attended more than one workshop. And what was able to happen then was we were then able to expand this knowledge to embed our first infant and early childhood mental health consultation model in early care and education. So DHS um, has a division, the Division of Family Development, who um, are, are overseers of our private child care work in New Jersey. And they recognize that while the training was really important, that's that first phase of awareness, again, the raising of the floor of awareness, we also needed to have some um, on-site support, coaching and consultation to help providers um, increase their own sense of reflectivity so that their stress would reduce and therefore their um, responsive interactions would increase. So again, trauma focused in that, again, thinking about relationships as being the solve to trauma, if our providers were themselves experiencing high levels of stress, this consultation model is meant to really support the adults who support children. So as their stress reduces and then their ability to be more responsive to children increases. And then during COVID, we were able to transition all of our Keeping Babies and Children in Mind workshops to virtually, uh, to fully virtual. We had never really done that before. We had tested it out the year before, which was good, <laughs> um, but now we were full state virtual. And, um, and we found such a um, need for attendance at that time. Our attendance sort of went through the roof actually. Um, and at the time, very soon, we learned that um, our workforce also needed more. And so we went back to the idea that was originally funded where we were partnering Keeping Babies and Children in Mind with a reflective group. And we started groups known as three C's groups, which are conversations for connection, comfort, and calm. And so we were able to offer these groups throughout the state as well, again, under CCDBG funding to multidisciplinary professionals to come together virtually uh, really very little agenda, but an opportunity again for connection and for comfort and for calm across disciplines in the workforce. So Jerry, I think we're going to move down to the last slides here. Um, so yeah, I don't we think have we some other stories. Sure. Yeah, of how what else we've done in New Jersey, but from a time perspective, um, we'll go to what we call our epilogue. And just to say, um, what we believe is that infant and early childhood mental health is everyone's business. And so as you keep hearing us say multidisciplinary, multi-systemic, um, it actually is everyone's business. If we focus on this time frame of the lifespan development, we all benefit. And so the more people we have who have that mindset, who sit at tables, um, who have um, both government or funding power or responsibility, um, this is how that champion, you know, had gotten this, this work happening for KBCM. She understood 
that um, infant mental health was everybody's business. And she also understood that trauma exists for infants and young children. And we heard Mahler say, unfortunately, sometimes that gets easily forgotten. You know, uh, if I could just uh, jump in on that. And Dan, by the way, Dan asked if we are coordinating with Dave Ellis. Um, Dave Ellis in New Jersey heads our uh, trauma-informed ACEs uh, resilience uh, office in our Department of Children and Families. Um, a lot of this began before they joined New Jersey, but Caitlin and I uh, actually had lunch with Dave. We've been talking and being part of meetings with him for a while, but we actually had lunch with him, Dan, last week um, and face-to-face uh, -face for the first time in a while. So we are continuing to work with him. But I think what Caitlin said is true. And I think some of the story that we couldn't cover in those intervening slides that you will have in your presentation is really about the idea that you didn't start, we didn't start this in the end. We started in the beginning. It's about relationships. It's about building relationships, people feeling safe that what you are doing is number one, not taking something away from them or demanding lots of things from them, except we're trying to offer them another way of thinking and another way of being with others. And so a lot of that relationship building occurred many, many years. It turns out the person at a Department of Children and Families who headed this initiative was a public health nurse uh, who worked in a home visiting program um, about 15 years ago. And I was their infant mental health consultant with my wonderful mentor, Taya Bree. And it was that connection with her and she became a real infant and early childhood mental health advocate. She was the one that really led us to get that uh, SSBG funding to do keeping babies and children in mind uh, and, and require it as what she and we call the foundational basis. So it's really become uh, a standard um, training that's required of, of people here. So here's the epilogue though. And Caitlin, do you want to lead folks through this? Sure, sure. So just we're, we're down at this idea that good promotion is often the best intervention. Um, and so uh, as you look at ARPA funds, which oftentimes right have, have time limited, oftentimes being told, especially at the state level, you can't put anything in place that's going to need sustainability because these, these funds are going to end. And I think if we can take the mindset that, yes, they're going to be good responses, we're going to create programming, programming or interventions that are good responsive now in the moment of this crisis, but to also ourselves think about them as actual promotional towards the next um, and actually allowing for um, skills, awareness, um, ways of being to be built up now so that the next time we have a better intervention because of the promotional work that we were doing ahead of time. So even though there, are, I, I, I hear it from our state now, well, we can't do anything that needs sustainability. You can even think about what can be a more in the moment model that then hopefully takes enough and has enough root that it becomes funded otherwise and then becomes a good promotional model. And when doing that, be inclusive to as many people as you can. Again, infant mental health is everyone's business. So um, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, and as Jerry had said before, um, we, we, we sometimes have to um, be able to share information through our um, goodness of heart um, and what is right. And so that first workshop, as we said, which became workshop four of keeping babies and children in mind was shared across the state without cost. Um, he says, I CMH experts must give. Um, and then Jerry, you, know, you wanna finish up? Uh, the keeping babies and children in mind actually began as a seven session series that our center offered at a pilot site headed by our Department of Children and Families a year before we were funded. And we, off, and we did that at no cost because we knew that um, we needed to show folks, number one, this information. Um, you know, our belief was, if you know better, you do better. And that's not my slogan. It's a slogan I think we all have heard many times. And we knew Maya that if Angela. they knew better, they would do, by Angelou, exactly. Mm -hmm. And by the way, she said, people will not remember what you did, but how you made them feel. This is also a change in how people see the value of this work. So um, Walter Gilliam, many of you may know as the leader of the preschool expulsion work in 2005, his first published paper demonstrating that preschool preschoolers were 
expelled at a rate higher than K to 12. Uh, we had a, a wonderful chance to have Walter uh, spend some time with us. And uh, when we did our own study in New Jersey as well on preschool expulsion, um, and um, we had a, a think tank we sponsored on preschool expulsion and he came with it, but he said something so meaningful. He said, he for years spoke to people about the critical importance of infant and early childhood mental health consultation. And he knew the research, he knew the data, and he said their eyes would glaze over. But when I told them that preschoolers were being expelled, they, they were shocked. And he said, I was presenting them a solution, infant and early childhood mental health consultation, but they hadn't seen the problem. And so in that regard, it was a wonderful lesson for us. And in some sense, um, you know, using the language of an, an old supervisor I had who really understood marketing, he said, you have to give them the sizzle and the steak. You have to really be sure they get it, right? So um, I don't know, Caitlin, there were a couple of other points, but I think we're, Caitlin's very kindly pushing me faster. So, <laughs> but if you, if you could just back up that slide, just to be sure uh, we see that. So you, I think the rest of it, we've tried to say, and, and, uh, and by the way, be righteous, not self-righteous. I have to tell you, it's so important because sometimes we can speak to folks and we are frustrated. We are saying, don't you get it? Don't you realize that you're asking for evidence, but the evidence what you're doing now is clear that it's not working? You have to form relationships. So uh, there you go. And this is the article we made reference to that we had uh, published in zero to three. Yeah, so I'm going to just pop that reference in the chat so everyone can yeah. have it. And folks, I'll put my email in the chat too. If you are looking for a copy of that article or any other information, please contact us. And Caitlin, you should do the same. I'll do yours, Caitlin. Okay. Thanks, Marlo. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jesse. Sing. Thanks, Sorry for Dan. taking too long, folks. Thank you both so much. No, I, I, I can tell in the chat activity that people are really appreciative uh, to learn about the story. Um, Jerry, there was a question in the chat and you answered in the chat, but I just want to make sure people know the question and your answer about how did you get the workforce um, yeah. engaged in training? Can you just... A, yeah, that was such a great question um, and so critical because all these good ideas mean little if you can't find the right people who can do the work. When we were able to get funding and develop a plan for statewide launch in those 10 counties, we really recognized the need for a workforce that can do this work. And through a lot of my work in the state, Caitlin's work, other people, we were able to really put a call out into the major organizations, uh, the Coalition for Infant Toddler educators, the New Jersey Association for the Education of Young Children, the New Jersey Association for Infant Mental Health, Early Intervention Community, and we were able to identify a cohort of initial trainers and let them know our task is to really deploy them with this curriculum to a variety of sites with all these multiple partners in the field, and we actually had an assistant director hired just for logistics. He had to work with 10 counties in I'm going to say hundreds of different sites to be sure he could get the space donated that we had the equipment, the LCD projectors and space and so on. And with that, and we had a head of training and curriculum who met with these eight or so folks and really provided them with a training of trainers. Reviewed, we had, we were developing a, uh, a facilitator's guide. Um, we had in those days, uh, tried to had had to figure out when some sites didn't have internet access, uh, uh, availability how we could have all the video clips for the trainings and all the logistics. Bottom line is we spent a significant amount of time training them, and then they met at least weekly um, for reflective supervision and and consultation and guidance. And the head of training actually would contact each of them as well for individual support. So it was a critical translation. And by the way, now, seven years later, we just hired some of them for our infant and early childhood mental health consultation relational system that we're implementing statewide. So uh, once they entered, we don't let them go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I hope as you all hear Jerry talking about all the all the things that were done to make it all happen, that's that that's the kind of thing you would ask for funding for from either the Child Care Stabilization Fund or the Child 
care development block grant. And that's why, you know, doing this right now, why those rescue plan monies are allowed to be spent on this activity is so timely. Um, and why we're just really encouraging you to, to engage with us and trying to make that happen in your state. Um, could, uh, Jerry or Caitlin, could one of you speak to the cost of, of the keeping babies and children in mind curriculum? Sure, yeah. so because the curriculum was, was funded under um, state funding, the curriculum itself is no cost. Um, so the, the when we share it with other um, states, it's really just the train the trainer cost, which amounts to be about three thousand um, dollars. So um, yeah, our, we've our developed role, an agreement that, that uh, mm -hmm. folks have to sign, just and uh, you know informing them of the integrity of the material, but also participating in some assessment of of its impact. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and what we we share a Google Drive with all the facilitators in our state and across the country. And so anytime we make an update, we make sure that everyone is updated as well so that there's some continuancy there. Uh, we're back on oh. the Thursday. Uh, um, Kate, we have, I'm gonna ask one other question then we're gonna need to move on. But Caitlin, you and I, when we talked the other day, you shared something I think would be interesting for people to know that not it's not there's not always a it's not like uh, providers might be knocking down the door to come to a training. There is some so there are different ways that providers have a re demonstrate a readiness and and will engage in the training. And you have a tool that helps kind of gauge that. Could you talk through that for folks? Uh, sure. So that's for our consultation model. Um, oh. Yeah, but uh, but I think it's it's still it's still relevant that um, no good yeah yeah um, you know we believe obviously that with anything uh, people have to have hearts or heads or hands ready to or all of them you know to hear the information so you've all I'm sure experienced situations where you're with people who are voluntold to be there sometimes you know we're so amazing and magical that that will change someone's ideas but typically it's better when somebody wants to come to something. Um, when we do our consultation work, we have four different ports of entry. So someone can come in if they need, um, if they believe that they have some a child or a family that needs some assistance, which is a lot of infant mental health consultation is to say, I've got this kid I need you to fix. Um, but then also they can say, we need some assistance in our full program, or we need assistance in this one classroom, or we need assistance ourselves as leaders. Um, and then additionally, they can request some training. And so we can assess based on the assess uh, on the needs initially that maybe what we should actually do is come and actually just have a conversation. Um, so we start a lot of our work with this idea of relationships as central um, because it's uh, we don't want to be the people who are just talking down people, you know, and, and sharing slides and you know, spin in knowledge to people who already know it. We want to be able to engage someone to say, what is it that you need? Um, what is it that you need right now? And can we meet you with that need and usually we have something to say about that need typically um but when we're just saying other stuff it's not going to be as helpful or relevant so um with the training itself um we do have people who are told by their agencies they have to come somewhere but then even in the training you'll see if you are interested in the curriculum it's a highly reflective curriculum it's it's um there's a lot of knowledge there but it's it's tremendously reflective um personally and so even through that we usually have people start to feel more connected to it Thank you for that. And thank you for a great presentation. And uh, we're going to move to our next presenter now. But I just want to remind everyone that um, Caitlin and Jerry will be a part of our webinar that September 30th. And I'll chat the registration link again. Um, and so if you're thinking there are other people in your state who need to hear all of this, that's what, you know, that webinar is your opportunity. So thanks again, Caitlin and Jerry. And let me just hit enter on that registration link, and then I will move on to um, introduce our next speaker. I am delighted to introduce Kelly Crane, who's the State Policy Specialist for Prevent Child Abuse America, or PCAA. Um, CTIP and PCAA know that public policies have a material effect on people's lives and therefore in shaping the future for our children and our families. PCAA works alongside their nationwide network of state chapters and Healthy Families America sites to advocate and advance policies and strategies that support children and families. They advocate for federal and state level um, policies as a lever of change that will positively impact children and families and help prevent child abuse and neglect before it occurs. 
I've had the pleasure of advocating at the federal level with Kelly's colleague, Marissa Morabito, who's on maternity leave for anybody who knows Marissa. Um, Marissa is one of the nation's top experts on the federal maternal infant and early childhood home visiting program, or McB. Um, and many of us hold a friend and colleague in common, uh, Jennifer Jones, a friend of CTIP, uh, and you may know her for her work uh, uh, leading the Change in Mind Institute at the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities over the last number of years. Jen is now uh, the Chief Strategy Officer at PCAA. And a number of you all know Dr. Melissa Merrick, who's the current CEO of PCAA, who uh, formerly worked uh, on Adverse Childhood Experience um, team at the CDC. So lots of connecting points to this work and to people on this call. Um, and Kelly's gonna talk about the advocacy and support that PCAA focuses on through its federal and state policy agendas uh, including the outreach they're doing around the American Rescue Plan, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAFTA, McV, and more. So Kelly is going to present for about 20 minutes. Please chat your questions as she's talking, and we should have a few minutes at the end to um, uh, respond to your questions. So Kelly, go ahead. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you for, for having me. Um, thanks for inviting me, I'm Marlo and Jesse, and thanks for, this is a bigger group than I thought, and I was scanning through everybody, and I don't know many of you. <laughs> I only saw a few names, so this is really exciting to be in this coalition and in this partnership, so thank you for having me. I am going to try to share my screen as well, um, as I have some slides. There you go. Um, so Marlo did a really good job of helping me through some of these slides, so I will go a little quicker, maybe not even take the full 20 minutes. But just like Marla said, we are the um, nation's oldest and largest organization to committed, committed to preventing child abuse and neglect before it happens. We have chapters in many of the states, and I don't know if Jerry or um, Caitlin are familiar with Prevent Child Abuse New Jersey, but good. Um, Rush was there before Rush Russell and Gina Hernandez is there. It's a great, great chapter doing lots of great things. Um, and I can so see We work closely with them. Okay, good, good, good. All right. Oh, so that was, yeah, just our vision and our, our mission statement. Um, and then just to give you a flavor, Marla did a good job of this too, but to give you a flavor for those that aren't familiar with what it is Prevent Child Abuse America does, um, these are kind of the, the main areas of work that we're engaged in. We have our home signature, home, our signature home visiting model, Healthy Families America. Um, we have about 600 sites. It's the Second most frequently funded model under McBee, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, which is up for reauthorization next year. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and it's implemented yeah, throughout 30 different, 38 states and the District of Columbia and five US territories and Israel. So a big footprint of home visiting. We also advocate at the federal and state level for a lot of different um, family friendly, family focused um, policies that we that are known to prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, we also have a communications team that helps us shift the conversation from abuse and neglect to prevention. So building on the themes that were just shared by Jerry and Galen, moving more upstream towards the prevention. And, um, and finally, we provide a whole host of resources and support to our statewide network of prevent child abuse chapters. We're in 47 states. Um, and we partner closely with all of them to advance our collective mission and promote kind of thriving families and thriving communities. Um, and then lastly, as Marla mentioned, I should have backed up and started with, yeah, as um, many of you may or may not know that um, Dr. Melissa Merrick is at the helm of all of this and we're really excited. I think I started there a few months after Melissa. So, um, which is why I went to prevent, <laughs> one of the reasons why Prevent Child Abuse America called me, um, that she's just a great advocate for ACEs. She came from the um, Centers for Disease Control and was an expert, is an expert on adverse childhood experiences and one of the lead scientists on the ACEs study. Um, so she just has a real deep understanding of primary prevention and she's also a great person to work with. All right, and then this is a slide I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but I'm just sharing this to kind of relate back to the work that we're all engaged in. Um, I might use some different terminology that was used, but it's all kind of the same work and that we're all partners in this work. And if any of you have ever heard Dr. Merrick talk, um, she often says, and I think every conversation I've heard her talk is um, partnerships, oh my gosh, now I'm gonna mess up her quote. Um, what does she say? Partnerships 
Oh my gosh, I wrote it down and I forgot it. Um, prevention happens in partnerships. Um, so excited don't to Don't you here. hate that? I know. <laughs> I knew it. I wrote it down. <laughs> We're with you. We're with you. We got it. <laughs> um, but she often says prevention happens in partnerships. So excited to be a part of this partnership. Um, and then this just, yeah, the ACE is kind of um, slide shows kind of where we are rooted in the, the kind of angle we come come at when we work with family. So, all right. Another thing that um, we talk about often um, relating to the, um, the ACEs slide that it was just up there is how child abuse and neglect we identified as a public health issue, a public health crisis, which deserves a public health response. Um, so this is just a definition of a public health, the definition of public health from the Institute of Medicine. And it just points out how we all have a role to play to assure the conditions um, in which all people can be healthy. The picture obviously shows the, the mass that we all, we all play a role in each other's health and all play a role in kind of developing each other. So, um, so we are, um, as a result of COVID and racial unrest throughout the nation, there's been a lot of calls by advocates and calls by others to reform and take a really good look at our nation's child welfare system and how it can be just transformed. Um, so we are kind of a, a part of this urgency for creating a different response to families that are in need of supports and um, in need of services to prevent that, from, to prevent the child abuse and neglect from occurring in the first place. So there's, um, yeah, we're a part of many conversations that are calling for a more focused attention on investments in primary and secondary prevention efforts. We've seen that at federal level, at state levels, um, and advocates are, are asking and calling on the federal government to keep permanent a lot of the flexibilities and the changes and the regulations that have happened as a result of COVID, um, and that we should keep those in place because they've been seeing a lot of good results of that. So this is just an article um, from the imprint that was written by Dr. Melissa Merrick. No, she didn't, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Bart Click, our research strategy officer at Prevent Child Abuse in America. So to that end, we um, we agree and we're kind of, um, we've kind of reshaped kind of how we are, have been and how we're gonna continue to look forward um, with prevention being upstream and look at upstream so solutions. And so we're continuing to clearly articulate a comprehensive prevention vision and shifting the narrative to more upstream strategies and solutions, um, working with our networks, Healthy Families of America and the chapter network specifically to really activate and expand um, that network of champions. We've been played, um, been involved in a lot of different research and kind of reestablishing our role as a data-driven leader in prevention efforts. And we're hoping to continue to build our um, policy kind of footprint and build strategic coalitions um, around state and federal policies. And I realized that I should have been dropping some things in the chat for you all. Um, and I'm not even looking at it, but I will drop a few things oops, in the chat about just who our state chapters are. Um, if you want to click on that, it shows kind of who your state chapters are. Okay. So I'm going to just touch on some of the initiatives or priorities we have at Prevent Child Abuse America and some of the coalitions and um, priorities. Yeah. So. I'm doing too many things. So the first one, just to share with you, I don't know if you've heard of the Thriving Families, Safer Children, a commitment to well-being, but Prevent Child Abuse America is a part of this initiative. Um, we've just seen kind of, yeah, again, this is, it's built off of the public health crisis and the severity of its impact on families that have been involved with the child welfare system and the inequities of our current systems and the disparities that it produces. So the Thriving Families Safer Children Partnership um, has built on that momentum to examine new ways of working with families and new ways that's kind of transforming towards a system that achieves better outcomes for children and families. So this partnership is with Casey Family Programs, the Children's Bureau, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and Prevent Child Abuse America. Um, these organizations have come together and I'm, I think it's been, we're in year two and I but I feel like it's been a two to three year conversation, maybe even longer, um, with the goal of kind of creating a more just and equitable child and family well, well being system um, that benefits all children and families. Um, so that is the partners. And then this just shows the, the states that we are in round two. Round one um, happened with four jurisdictions. 
and they were selected because they had a kind of a I already had some of the pieces of the puzzle in place and um, they were have they had a clear vision to co-create a child and family well-being system. Um, so those kind of four jurisdictions, which are on my next slide, um, came together and shared a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things that they were doing in their own state or jurisdiction to then um, start round two of jurisdictions, which is a much larger learning cohort that are meeting right now. And they're, they're meeting to develop strategies that they believe will transform their existing child welfare system and kind of build on this momentum and um, movement towards upstream strategies. And so it's a coordinated effort of lo local jurisdictions and state jurisdictions that are coming together, committed to taking on system and policy level solutions. And here are the jurisdictions. So round, the first round, which was four jurisdictions are in the purpley, orange, whatever, purple, I don't know, red. And then there's 18 jurisdictions that are in that orange color that are in round two right now. Um, and a lot of these, they're in different varying places of how they're involved in the Thriving Family Safe for Children, but really taking the work back to their own state and forming coalitions and state level kind of system, state level, yeah, kind of um, cohorts to really dig into this work and policy solutions. And then this is just a, a quote by Dr. Merrick um, talking about how this is an extraordinary moment and it a shift from a punitive child welfare system to a child and family well-being system that focuses more on primary prevention and thriving families is shifting that conversation and doing that. So next, just wanted to share our engagement in research that we're focused on building, kind of building the evidence base and um, the public health imperative through innovative research. And we are partners with, we just joined I can't remember what year I went either, but a three-year, $1 million grant from the CDC we received last year, I think, to study the effects of paid family leave and child care subsidies on child maltreatment and intimate partner violence. And I have a link there too I should share. Let me add that. I think I sent it. There you go. Um, there's just a link about what that study is about and how we're looking at it. And we're really digging into whether these policies prevent violence and if they work for some families, but not others and kind of how they, what role these policies play in the risk factors for violence. And we're hoping that the, the research will contribute to a growing evidence around the effects of economic supports. There's just been a lot of talk around concrete economic supports and how that is helping families um, and reducing child maltreatment. So hoping that what we are doing at Prevent Child Abuse in America under this grant, we'll, we'll only build that evidence. We also have, um, Jennifer Jones was mentioned at the beginning who came from, um, brought a lot of different resources to Prevent Child Abuse America. And one of them is that we join forces with the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities and Council on Accreditation, along with the Frameworks Institute to update. There was a 2004, prevention framing brief on um, how we talk about prevention. And so we work together with the Frameworks Institute to update that, that framing. And so to really make the case for the policies and the strategies that we need to ensure that every child grows up in a safe, stable, nurturing environment. Um, and it helps to kind of widen the lens to include some of the factors that help shape those environments and helps to tell the story. So there's um, six recommendations listed here that came out of that. Um, rec framing kind of conversation. And I will share that one too, because I have that link close. Um, but we did a, a webinar, we had a lot of conversations, um, shared our, our report, and these six strategies are, are pulled out in this report. Um, and we just received funding from Casey Family Programs to work on a toolkit with a, yeah, no, we're excited with a really kind of creative messaging and press material or, press materials or like boilerplate kind of um, things to say and other tools that will help all of you guys, but also help our Prevent Child Abuse America state chapters and our HFA sites and all of our partners to really reframe how we're communicating child, childhood adversity. Um, and so we're hoping um, October, but that's, that's closer than I realized, um, but we're, that is that is in the works to, to kind of really create a toolkit based on what we learned from that frameworks discussion. And then we also do a, um, a lot of advocacy at the federal level as well as the state level. But each year we 
develop policy and a policy agenda. And that kind of guides our work at the federal level and how our state chapters help us um, in that advocacy. And so this year, our federal policy agenda, um, we have been working on reauthorizing and increasing funding for CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act, um, prioritizing prevention in the federal budget and in policy decisions. So working with kind of those relevant committees around funding decisions, um, a lot of work around McV, the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting, um, reauthorization of that. It's up to expire end of September of 2022. Um, and so we're asking as part of a lot of other coalitions to double the funding for McV. So from 400 million to 800 million, we'll see. Um, but a lot of conversations in place around that right now. Because last, when it was up for reauthorization before it lapsed. Um, so we had like about a seven to eight month lapse in funding and we don't wanna see that happen again. Um, so a lot of work is already happening in that realm. Um, We've monitored the implementation of Family First. Um, I know it was a federal legislation, but we're help working at the state level too to just kind of help states figure out where they are with that. Um, and then working with Congress to prioritize the prevention of child sex abuse. So those are kind of our, the five priorities that we laid out last year. And then to that end, some of the things we're engaged in, um, sounds like a lot of you are as well, but just really doing federal outreach and um, partnering with members of Congress and staff, um, educating them around these prevention issues. We also engage in um, advocacy alerts where we kind of mobilize our chapter network to reach out to their member of Congress around the RISE Act is one of them actually. And then um, um, thanking them for all the inclusions in the ARPA <laughs> around um, the funding for CV cap, things like that. We've signed on to different pieces of legislation and support. Um, and also been able to, to see some language in, in legislation and, and tweak it where it was needed or, or recommend some changes or improvements or additions, so things like that. And then we also have um, state policy priorities, which is where I sit. Um, and we have developed a list of priorities every year too as well that closely match our federal priorities, but the main ones that this year were around increasing funding and access to evidence-based home visiting programs in states, expanding family-friendly workplace policies, uh, strengthening the economic security for families, investing in evidence-based programs to prevent child sex abuse and ending the use of corporal punishment in schools. So those were kind of the five priorities that we put out this year and then when working with our state chapters around how to how to make some of these happen, how to advance some of these in their own state. Um, New Jersey is a good example of that. So that um, we've worked with New Jersey who um, has the recent bill that was passed on universal home visiting. So just really exciting. We played you know, a tiny, tiny role, but, it's, um, but it really exciting to see that some of these things come to, when they ha happen in state level policies, it's exciting. And I'll share those two things too. Um, I'll put our, I think we got it. Um, those two policy agendas, I just dropped into the chat as well. You're interested. Um, so at the state level too, how we do that work is um, we, one of the direct ways we do that is through what we call our government affairs initiative, where we work with, we work with all of our state chapters, but the government affairs initiative is kind of a, um, an application process that the state chapters go through where they apply to be a part of the government affairs. And to, we're in round three, year three, of that works and we've done six kind of chapters at a time to really meet one-on-one -on -one with the chapter monthly and help them advance their state policy agenda they already have in place or help them create one. Um, so through that, we've done a lot of just setting policy priorities or developing communication materials or talking points, done just a training on advocacy and how, to, how that happens in, at the state level, um, things like that. Oops. And this is just a, some of the state level advocacy work we've done recently, just this summer, that um, some of the direct engagement in Delaware, they, um, they had a paid family leave and a minimum wage bill up um, this year, the minimum wage bill did pass. So we just did a, a education kind of um, advocacy meeting with their legislators that were sponsoring those bills and then their kind of network to talk about the links of those policies and the impact they play on the prevention of child abuse and neglect. We met with the Children and Families Committees in both chambers of the New York legislature to talk about Family First and where they are in their state where other 
states are at with their family first um, prevention plans. And then we had a discussion with a senator in Tennessee around the importance of engaging with your state legislature around these issues and how to, how to kind of become an advocate in your own state. And we do this all through a lot of coalitions and a lot of partnerships at the federal level, at the state level. But we have, um, we sit on a, a number of committees. The most kind of the biggest one probably is the National Home Visiting Coalition and then also the National Child Abuse Coalition where there's, uh, I'm sure some of you probably sit on those as well, but a, um, a whole host of partnerships and range of experts and that we work together around to kind of move agendas forward at the, at the federal level. Almost it. So we do all this through partnerships. Um, and so this is, yeah, I'll end this with a quote that Melissa Merrick had, but just talking about how we, this prevention happens in partnerships and we can't do this alone. And that this is kind of, all of this is a continuum of many partners along the way to make sure that um, children can grow up in safe um, environments. And that is my last slide. So thank you. Wow, 20 minutes on the dot. Thank you for inviting me, Marlo. Thank you for inviting me, Jesse. This is a great group to be a part of. So I'm just excited to hear and learn from you all. So thank you. Thank you, Kelly, so much. You gave so much great information. And I'm going to give you a minute to breathe and, and give uh, put folks a minute to uh, put questions in and draw some connections. So I didn't see it on the slide, but PCAA is also a member of the Child Trauma and ACEs Policy Work Group, which is... Um, uh, CTIP is on the steering committee for that work group, and um, and so we're we're connected in that way in terms of the national trauma campaign that I know many of you are part of. Um, all connects in through what we refer to as CTAP or the Child Trauma and ACEs Policy Work Group, which is a federal work group. So that's one connection I want to make. And then um, from I, I know a little bit about the Thriving Families Initiative that Kelly talked about. I appreciate you sharing and appreciate the leadership PCAA is giving on that and. From what I know about the network of folks on this call, I would encourage you to, to try to connect, figure out the way if you're not already connected into that, to connect into it if it's in your state. Um, because I think there is value in folks who understand trauma-informed approaches and all of that to be connecting with folks who are trying to think through how to build this system of child and family well-being because it's not necessarily, those connections are not necessarily already made. And so your, your advocacy and knowledge um, may be needed and valued to, to make those connecting points. Um, hey, Mar Marlo, this is Jerry Costa. Could I do a quick ask? Uh, yeah. Affiliated with uh, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has been a national coalition building of, of regional coalitions for terrorism and disaster. And it's all trauma focused, led by Howard and Joy Osofsky from Louisiana State University. We have a Northeast Regional Terrorism and Disaster Coalition. And by the way, the folks in Delaware, we'd love to them. We had some Delaware representation. And I just, if anyone is interested in the regional coalition building happening nationally, um, I'll, again, I gave my email, please contact me. Uh, Cause that's also helping. I think Jesse, you came to one of our meetings early on, right? So thanks. That's great. That's great. Um, great to know about. Um, and I wanna pick up on uh, Kelly shared the framing brief that she talked about that PCA did in partnership with the Alliance and COA. Um, and I don't know if Bridget is still on, but Bridget and I have been in, in, in working for a long time along with many others to try to really spread the framing science and those framing briefs. So Bridget, I don't know if you wanna make a comment. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. So if you don't, it's okay. But, um, but the, I just wanna emphasize that the, the framing briefs are not only immediately useful for you to work on your own communications, but they're sort of a meta strategy in that if all of us begin to use that same framing and that same language, we get a lot more power in our advocacy and our influence. So it's, it is immediately useful in your work to help you with your own talking points and elevator speeches and writing publications and all of that and know that you're framing it based on a scientific approach about what's really going to help people hear your message. But it's also kind of a movement, if you will, um, to say if we all join in and use the same language, we, get, we gain a lot from that. 
Do you want to say anything, Bridget? <laughs> here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so um, I don't know that I saw any other questions, and I, I know. Jess, you might have one or two, but also just want to give Kelly back the floor for a minute, see if you've thought of anything else or if you want to respond to anything that I've shared. No, thanks again for having me. I just, I, you're, Marlo, that um, you're right about the framing messaging and that it's hopefully applicable and you can pull stuff out even without the toolkit yet. But um, yeah, when members of Congress, when policymakers, when advocates hear the same message or the same frame of a message, it's um it resonates and they, you know how that what's the same you have to hear something 10 times before you remember it like if you kind of start to say the same things in the same way um it starts to resonate more yeah yeah thanks kelly jesse are there any questions that you want to uh, throw in before we um no i saw dan come off mute so dan do you have a question that you want to ask yeah i had a question for jerry <clears throat> could you talk about those regional regional coalitions because CTIP and uh, PACES Connection have been holding these conference uh, quarterly calls of regional trauma-informed coordinators. And I'm wondering whether we're do doing something in duplicate and we ought to get together on it. <laughs> Jerry, you are muted. Just really want to hear what you're saying, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the, um... The coalition building nationally was funded through SAMHSA for a three-year grant, and they have a one-year co uh, no-cost extension, which is in the fourth year now, headed by Louisiana State University, uh, Dr. Joy, Joy Osofsky and Dr. Howard Osofsky. And so they began first with the Gulf Coast region, um, which I think is uh, New York, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, trying to remember the contiguous states who else joined them. We were the second coalition, Northeast Regional Coalition, and we have New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and again, Delaware had been part of us originally. And then there was a growing um, Midwestern coalition that's still in formation. Um, and so what I can do, Dan, if you're interested, I can communicate with you and even plan a time to speak uh, with the head of the coalition, uh, Joy Osofsky. Uh, it's a great process. We meet monthly with these representative share resources. We actually are uh, have done a, a small study about the impact of COVID on teachers and uh, and families, and we're planning a second one now between both our state and Louisiana. So, love to share that with you. Um, and if anyone is interested, Terry Lawler, I see you are. I'll send you some stuff. And the, the coalitions are early childhood coalitions. What what is the exact? No, well, you know, uh, the partners include uh, folks who work with uh, disaster and terrorism responses and trauma throughout the age range. Uh, it turns out that many of the people who've joined have really been early childhood, but no, it runs throughout um, throughout the age uh, span. And the coalition purpose is to share resources. Uh, actually, um, we have a base camp repository with hundreds of articles and curricular materials that members can access that uh, base camp repository. Um, and we also um, develop materials. We just developed, and I can put the links in the, uh, in the uh, chat area, we just developed two Two really important, I think really helpful, I shouldn't say important, you'll tell me if they're important, but helpful guides for teachers and for families on how to speak to children about the return uh, to face-to-face -to -face, uh, uh, school and, and it, child care and education. So it, it's just been a good group and I, I'd be happy to plan another time, uh, uh, Dan, if that would help. I, I, I'd really uh, like to do that. Yeah, I would love to. It, it sounds like yeah. there's an opportunity to bring two good operations together. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. And Joy Osofsky is remarkable. The team at Louisiana okay. is wonderful. <laughs> Jerry, are you, while you're putting those links in the chat, um, just to remind folks, I will send all of the links that were shared in the chat in the follow up email which is going to prove to be a very hefty email, which is generally a good thing. Um, in addition to that, one thing that we generally do, Kelly, Jerry, Caitlin, is uh, share the slides that presenters have. And so if you don't mind sending me those slides as well, just wanted to throw that out before we were off the call. 
Um, again, did, if, if folks aren't sure if they will be, if they are on the CTIP CAN listserv, please feel free to send me an email um, and I'm happy to put you on that listserv. Uh, Marlo, I'll turn it back over to you in case there are any other questions from the audience here. Before I don't think there out. are other questions, and I, and I appreciate that you said you're going to share all these resources out because I wanted to make sure people know that they're coming, you'll have them. And I want to, in closing, um, make sure that you know that you'll get the link. I chatted it much earlier, but it's hard to get back up to it. Um, of the, the document I shared with you that um, the BUILD Initiative and Zero to Three and several other uh, leading national organizations have put together to say, here are the different rescue plan provisions that can be spent on infants and toddlers. It's it's an impressive resource. Um, uh, and so I wanna make sure you know that it's there and I wanna leave you with the call to action to engage on behalf of babies and toddlers. They need you. We all know that what they're going through is affecting their brain architecture and affecting their development. And you are the people who need to be elevating that and getting your decision makers in your state to direct resources um, toward their well-being. So please join us in doing that. Join us on the 30th and, and invite others to join um, for the webinar. We'll fix the glitches. Thanks to those of you who are letting us know we have some problems with our registration link. It was our first time to send it out today. So we'll fix that. Um, and I hope everyone well, has yeah. what also want to encourage people to join us in October. We're going to have uh, <laughs> Two great presentations. Bob Lieberman, I see, is on the line, but a presentation on a regional trauma informed initiative in Western Oregon, and then a presentation on the Arizona statewide trauma informed initiative. Uh, what, <laughs> what a state and what a region are doing to put trauma informed programs at the front. So join us in mid October for, uh, for another session. That'll be October 20th, 2 to 3 30. CTIP can is always the third, or I should say two to 3.30 Eastern time. That is unfair of me. Um, but CTIP can is always the third Wednesday of the month during the same hour and a half long period. The link will be the same. So you all have that. So feel free to put that in your calendar. We certainly hope to see you there. Um, and Marla the National, National Trauma Campaign has our, our campaign office hour, which is just an open-ended call in an hour. Is that right? Half hour. In a half hour from now. You want to chat that? Link. Do you have uh, it, yes. Andy? Just as people, and, and we'll wrap up. So I want to say thank you to Caitlin and Kelly and Jerry very much for um, being with us today. And thank you all for um, your engagement in today's call and all the work that you're doing. And so we'll, we'll stay a little bit longer to get that last link in for anybody who wants to join us in a half hour for the, for the office hour um, for any follow-up, but thank you all very much and hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Be well.